All right, welcome everybody. Today we have Alfredo Guevara from Harvard. Uh, please take it away, Alfredo. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, every time I come here, I get really motivated and post up and start thinking about amplitudes and, and gravity. Uh, so this time is no exception. And uh, I would like to tell you about internal black hole spectroscopy and uh, twister symmetry. So when I say twister, I did mean subdual, subdual gravity, and I will explain what, what, that, what that means in a second. So um, you might have heard this slogan, black hole is the 21st century atom. What it means is that the black hole was you know, mathematically discovered. It was pondered whether it makes sense or not. The singularities are weird. It was then sort of internalized in the, in the theory and in physics, in high energy physics, it has been uh, sort of, uh, if there were experiments that were proposed to measure it and to try to understand uh, what's going on. And now we have uh, this, for instance, these two of my, of my favorite experiments uh, uh, just uh, realized. So uh, the first one is uh, it's called BLBIs, very large, very large baseline interferometry. It's looking at the black hole center of our galaxy, uh, Sasha A star. And uh, this is a recent picture. Uh, taken by the Horizon Telescope, and this one, of course, is the uh, gravitational wave interferometer. So these are two different uh, uh, frequency bands, different sort of, um, sort of size of black holes. It's looking at big guys in the center of galaxies. It's looking at small black holes roaming in some interstellar space. But nevertheless, they sort of complain. They sort of uh, check what, out. Alfredo, what's the mass of this guy supposed to be on the left? This one is supposed to be. Uh, yeah, actually, there's like a order of magnitude here. <laughs> like yeah. an M. There's like 10 to the 6 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Good catch. Yeah, good catch. This yeah. M could be mass of galaxy. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> it's not the same M. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah good catch. Yeah. Like, we actually don't, don't have a, rough, a good estimate as, as of now. Um, so we live in an era of precision gravity. And the name of the game, of course, is to come up with accurate predictions for this astrophysical black hole. So we need to come up with tests for strong gravity regimes. And in particular, uh, we are very lucky because on our favor, we have this sort of mathematical miracle called the Kerr metric, right? So this is a form of, uh, 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 this is a closed form solution of you know, relativity of Einstein equations that sort of populate the universe in the sense that we believe, although we need to sort of cross check that, that most black holes are really rapidly rotating very close to extremity out there. And, and because of that, the Kerr metric is such an important ingredient in our, in our quest for actually testing strong gravity. So we can say nowadays that this has been tested some precision experimentally. Actually, if you look at this sort of photon ring that's coming out of the care of the care metric, I, I will describe in a, in a second, uh, you can actually measure deviations from, from the estimate size of the horizon, and you can actually measure the size of the, of the shadow, and you will find very, very slight, very, very mild deviations uh, that, uh, that uh, you, know, you can attribute to some sort of effective theory, theory corrections. But so far, it's, it's sort of, Within the ten percent of of of, uh, of matching, so uh, so how come how come how can we make these predictions? So how can we do this phenomenology? Well, what we need to do is we need to take this metric and we need to solve this way and with these geodesic equations, right? So um, there are many ways of, of doing that. Uh, if you solve this geodesic equation, essentially you are looking at these sort of photon orbits, and you will find that there's some unstable photon orbits that sort of come out. Of the black hole uh, photon ring, and they reach the observer at some at some final time. These are the things that we can see just because they orbit many many times. So these are the things we are looking at in this in this picture. Uh, but this sort of geodesic regime is nothing but this sort of large L regime of the of the more general wave equation. So actually, the geodesic equation is just a small regime inside the sort of full fledged phenomenology that the wave equation has. So if you solve the wave equation, essentially you're you're doing this sort of Schrodinger problem. You're solving some particular Hamiltonian, you can understand that as solving some particular quantum field theory amplitude. And, and that also uh, connects very well to uh, what has been done here at UCLA by SV and, and, and his friends. But also, this sort of full general uh, 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 wave uh, equation that's valid at L, any L has also information about uh, lower L modes, right? So even the low L modes can tell you something about mergers, they can tell you about uh, what happens at the ring down. If you look at the ring down of uh, two mergers uh, for long enough time, you can actually see that uh, there's certain there's certain difference between black holes and non-black holes. So for instance, even a, a wormhole will have some some uh, 
some uh, uh, some avatar at late times. So um, the problem with this is that uh, even computing finite L or large L or, or low L is still very hard. And the reason is that these wave or geodesic equations are, are not solvable in terms of elementary functions. Okay, so these are complicated functions. And we need to sort of remind us or sort of come back to uh, under undergraduate days where you know we have to solve this two-body Kepler problem, and it was very easy. And we never care about you know complicated functions, you just do algebra, you don't need a computer, you solve it. Uh, one of the reasons that happens, it, it can be solved with elementary methods, is that there is an underlying symmetry in that problem, which essentially tells you that there are orbits that have some ellipticity, and that ellipticity is constant. So uh, the, the first symmetry that we all know is, is, is Laplace, with this uh, angular momentum vector that tells you something happens in a plane. But actually, there's that a hidden, a hidden symmetry is called the Laplace from Gelens vector that tells you that whatever that axis of that, that orbit is, is pointing out, that's going to be constant over time. So actually, you'll find that this Kepler problem is this ellipse that we all know and love. And it, this is not only a, 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 a feature of the Kepler problem, it's indeed a feature of the, of the hydrogen atom. So the hydrogen atom quantum mechanically realized this symmetry. And that's the reason that you can actually solve it with elementary methods of quantum mechanics. In fact, even Pauli, uh, in the early days of quantum mechanics, realized this symmetry in order to compute the spectrum. Actually, I don't know what the paper title is, but if you know some German, you will see what, what's, what's going on. <clears throat> so the situation changes drastically in general relativity because the solution of the wave equation uh, is actually given in terms of this confluent height function. So it's a very complicated second order differential equation. And even the geodesic equation that you, you can say is some approximation of this uh, so complicated wave equation, even that even still has a lot of complexity just because you have to deal with this so, uh, uh, not, not very friendly integrals. They are indeed ellipt elliptic functions. So that's just one example here taken from this paper or the kind of integrals you have to do. So in any case, you have to come up with some simplification or some approximation, and you have to consider some equatorial plane. Uh, you, can, you can consider the large spin limit, the extremal case, whatever. There are some approximations that allow you to sort of go deeper and deeper in the in the elliptic functions. Uh, but you know, people say the black hole is the 21st century atom. So it's it's convenient to ask at this stage, what is the hydrogen atom, and what is the sort of undergrad or textbook example that we can just sit and solve systematically without any approximation. We can just solve exactly. And that sort of hints or that question sort of resonates with the existence of an integral sector because in the Kepler problem, the reason was that there is a symmetry, there's a hidden symmetry realized by this LRL vector. So there is some perhaps notion of integrability also in the art. And then of course there are more phenomenological implications. So if you know this example, this toy model, you can say, okay, what are the implications? So can we say something about our universe uh, 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 in the same in the same way that we can still say that our universe has these ellipses? They just keep rotating, right? But at, at first order, they still look like ellipses adiabatically. So what are the implications? Okay, so the the answer to those questions would be yes, but to motivate that, we need to sort of go a little back to what happened in the care problem and why is care so hard. So uh, the first clue is that. Here has this sort of hidden symmetry. It's called the killing Yano and the killing tensor. And we don't really know where it comes from, or at least at, the, at this time, but there are many, many sort of mathematical constructions that lead you to this object. And the, the cool thing about this object is that it's conserved in the sense that classically, if you think about this as momentum, this, this is a charge that's conserved under the evolution of this Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian is your wave equation. So these two things commute. That means that you can diagonalize in the wave equation uh, in terms of a uh, spectrum of the Casimir, right? So you can just come up with Casimir eigenstates and diagonalize your solutions. Or in terms of geodesic, you can always say that this is a conserved charge and then you integrate, this is just a constant of integration. Uh, so this miraculous existence of the scaling tensor together with these two isometries, the isometry in time and the isometry in rotation per, uh, angular velocity, is the reason that we can find a closed form of the wave and the geodesic equations. Without that, we don't even have a formula. We don't even have uh, uh, something to solve. Okay, so I show you this elliptic interest that assumes that we have this. And in fact, for the wave equation, it's looking very similar. We have this sort of second order differential equation, 
And you can see that thanks to the existence of this killing tensor, you can essentially separate this into an angular component and a radial component. And that's all what you need to solve. So at least you can write an expression. This was famously, famously pointed out by Tchaikovsky from his spin. But even though you can write this, this miraculous expression, there's still a second order coin equation here. So we actually need to come up with better ideas to solve this thing. So very recent progress, uh, usually doing some expansion in terms of the spin parameter or something, uh, has been done in this very nice work by uh, MST. And there's also recent progress trying to understand the confluent hypergeometric functions as uh, coming from some partition function in cyber with them here. So that's also- What's MST? What's MST? Uh, good. I I don't I I know the names, but I won't I won't pronounce them. Is Masaki someone else would know? So someone here would know. No. Okay. It's a it's a Japanese group. I'm so sorry for I, I'm so sorry for MST for not being able to pronounce this. <laughs> but yeah, so it's a particular expansion, a particular expansion of the solution of the real equation. Um. So um. More recently, uh, we have uh, we have learned about a set of conformal symmetries that have been proposed for rotating black holes of any spin. And the the cool thing, so this was proposed with holography in mind, with uh, ADS-CFT in mind. But uh, the, the the interesting outcome of this sort of hidden symmetry, and I, I will explain that in a second, is that we can solve the wave equation. Okay, so this sort of complicated current function current function can be approximated exact. In a, in, a, in a particular regime. And that regime corresponds to what's called the near sum. So you have to do some separation of the scales here. There is some sort of near sum uh, near the black hole, there's some far sum of the wave, and then there's some kind of buffer sum where you can just match them. And it is argued in, in this paper that actually the ambiguity in this matching surface where you can just match these two computations has some scaling symmetry. It has some scaling ambiguity that can be promoted to this conformal symmetry. So uh, even if you don't like the words, you know, SL2R cross SL2R, the fact is that this scaling symmetry uh, tells you what kind of representations uh, you will find when you solve the, the equation in near sum. So you can actually use it uh, to compute scattering and absorption cross sections uh, just by matching uh, matching uh, to the far sum. So these are things that you can observe. Um, um, yeah. So it's a symmetry of the near zone in the sense of it's it happens close to that black hole and it's happening it's happening for small energies. That's what uh, uh, that's what uh, you should keep in mind. Uh, so the symmetry was you know it was motivated by ads CFT. There was a vacuum uh, that has some 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 interesting properties called the Frolop Frolop Thorn vacuum. Uh, people computed some two D CFT correlations. But in practice, we can actually derive things from it that we can measure. Uh, in fact, these symmetries, a very, very close version of the original symmetries, has been adapted to explain the tidal deformability of black holes. So actually, if you throw like this uh, gravitational uh, sort of electric waves to a black hole, you expect, expect, expect it to respond in some way, to deform in some way. That's me measured by these quantities called the log numbers. And it is found that thanks to the existence of this SL2R symmetry, the same conformal symmetry, essentially, uh, these quantities, these response coefficients vanish. And in fact, the sort of underlying reason is that uh, the wave equation sort of assembles itself into, uh, into representations of the SL2R. And these SL2R representations uh, have a particular polynomial structure that tells you there is no response, if that makes any sense. So this was recently pointed out in this paper and also in so follow up works. So this this SL2R symmetry can be taken as an input to constrain whatever EFT description of uh, black hole tidal responses you want to write down. Okay, so despite all these very nice results, it's still mysterious where, the, where are these things coming from. Uh, in this talk, we want to explain that the origin of this conformal structure, well, we want to explain the origin of the conformal structure and better understand when it's valid and when it's exact and when it's approximate. So we'll be shown that the symmetry is exact at the so-called self plot point. And the self plot point is indeed corresponds to an, in an integrable system, which is quite literally the hydrogen atom. And by that, I mean that, well, essentially the wave equation is quite literally the hydrogen atom equation. So it's your kind of toy, sort of, depending on how you call, call it, but it's your sort of exact soluble model that has an actual SO4,2 symmetry. And I will explain the, the whole symmetry structure of the hydrogen atom. 
And finally, we will argue that we can perturb this self flow solution linearly to recover the more interesting solution, the astro astrophysical care solution, essentially doing uh, what's called a hyperfine structure splitting uh, away from the sort of symmetric solution. And moreover, a remnant of the symmetry survives that should already be more or less explicit from the previous slides, because uh, uh, what I'm telling you is that right now, there's an exact uh, exact region of probability that sort of be becomes approximate as you be as you go away from the self point. Before I continue, is there any question? And maybe on the previous slide, I don't understand the last sentence. Um, the previous slide. How do you use the SL floor symmetry on the EFP? I mean, the EFP doesn't go about that. Like, how, are you thinking about a word line? Like, what do you mean by oh yeah, what, what, yeah. So there are many FT descriptions. There's a word line one. There's sort of effective uh, field theory. Uh, but what I'm saying is that there is a particular set of law of uh, of uh, uh, Wilson coefficients. Are you saying that there's a transformation that says those will go to zero? Like right. Like yeah. Action? Yeah. So if you if you assume the, the 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 existence of the symmetry, the symmetry sort of transforms uh, transforms different components of your of your of your tensors. In such a way that you can constrain this law, this 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 Wilson coefficient. So it's literally a transformation of the drawing or the action that sets the Wilson coefficient. Right, but but the question of what effective action we need to use is, is a more subtle question. Also, the, the previous thing is the scalar wave equation SL two R that was true of spin vector tensor equation. Yeah. You mean this? No, no, I mean the next. This, this is a statement about the, sorry, the the previous slide. This one. I mean, so this is some statement about um, scalar wave equation, but is it, is it true for the other wave? Yeah, it's true for the other wave. It's for any spin uh, of the wave. In fact, these generators here, I wrote only for spin zero, but they have a very simple correlation. Essentially, coming from the Tukowski equation. So the Tukowski equation admits certain approximation for any spin in this near sum. Okay, so uh, so what does this self dual point mean? Well, the technical definition is you take the Hodge of your Riemann tensor and then you get back plus or minus i because you're in uh, Lorentzian signature, so the, the eigenvalues are plus or minus i. Uh, in this matrix, this operation does something very, very nice. It just projects out your negative helicity gravity. So you end up with a particular chirality in your field. But so, uh, a deeper a, a, a deeper consequence is that these self-dual solutions indeed were very, 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 very deeply studied in the uh, 70s and 80s as gravitational instantons. So these are subtle points for your Euclidean and Palutera. And the cool thing about these gravitational instantons is that they are the, the gravity analog of the usual and, uh, and very well-known monopoles or dipoles or, or dions and all the funny things that happen in Germany's theory. So they carry some topological charge. They have some topological singularity. And that's a topological singularity you can essentially uh, measure asymptotically. So they are not asymptotically flat. They are called asymptotically locally Euclidean spaces because actually they have some sort of angle deficit uh, uh, away from the away from the instant. However, these were not taken seriously in terms of phenomenological consideration. They were essentially uh, used for quantum gravity, and there was a stream of using uh, quantum instantons to quantize certain backgrounds. But the phenomenological implication of this thing is actually very, very well, very, very understudied. So, so why is that? <clears throat> so let's suppose that we take the care solution and we add an extra parameter. Okay, so actually you try to solve an equation with some answers, you find that it's an extra parameter, and if that space we can call the not the not parameter. And this one even this one found a long time ago by, by Plevansky. What happens is that once you add this not parameter, you have the so-called missing string which is an analog of the Dirac screen in, in, in such a way that there is a sort of angle deficit in the time direction. So in the Euclidean case, you will have some sort of conical deficit. And then you can sort of, you know, shift your missing string around, but, you know, it's a gate choice, you will always find this missing string. So it's kind of problematic because in the Lorentzian case, it's like a closed time like curve, and therefore we, we violate causality. Okay, so that's the reason that phenomenologically, this was very, very hard to, to digest. However, uh, uh, 
um, um, very recently with, with Andy and some of the people, we actually proposed a sort of novel signature of this uh, of this uh, Misner string. In Tukuma 2, you can sort of analytically continue one more time from the Euclidean space and reach a configuration when there's no there's no uh, there's no uh, Misner string. And in fact, it's a configuration that's very natural from 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 the scattering problem. Uh, so I don't expect you to to get much from this, but essentially every time you rotate time. Uh, you have to rotate something that uh, that's kind of parity odd, right? So so you rotate your spin vector and you rotate your nut charge because these are kind of angular momentum. So that you can think of this as being like angular velocity or something, has a dt over it. And if you if you want to rotate theta, you sort of unwind one 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 direction. So um, so um, <clears throat> what happens when you include this nut charge at generic at generic nut nut parameter? What happens is that uh, you have, uh, well, in general, you have these SL2 plus SL2 generators of this near sum equation that I, I was talking about. And just as in the three dimensional case, in fact, these SL2 generators of the near sum equation are broken in the sense that because you have these five coordinates here and phi is periodic, you cannot say that these generators are well defined. Right? These are broken symmetries essentially because you identify one of your coordinates. So this is a familiar situation from three-dimensional uh, gravity. We know from BTC uh, black holes that there is indeed some kind of identification that keeps like the local symmetries, but not the global ones. So indeed, we find that there is some vacuum quantum in, in the quantum theory. There will be some vacuum with with this with these temperatures. Uh, but after you consider this analytic uh, continuation that uh, that uh, we did, uh, this sort of analytic continuation. You kind of play, you can kind of play around a little bit with the temperature right and temperature left. So remember, this tells you about broken symmetries. And very famously, as we approach the regime where the temperature right vanishes, uh, we're taking this to zero. What we reach is this extremal black hole. And we know uh, there's a whole literature on this case that there's an emergent rotational isometry for something that had no rotational isometry, which is the Kerr black hole. As we as, as we approach the extremal case. There is a sort of neck, this near horizon extremal geometry that has an SL2R just because uh, it's very, very close to the horizon. And this SL2R is just one of the copies of that wave of, of that of that uh, symmetry. The other one is indeed uh, hidden. Uh, uh, sorry, I should say it's an isometry. So it's a symmetry of the metric now. It's actually a rotation. Uh, and the other one is actually hidden, uh, uh, but this is still uh, uh, sort of isometry, some other ABS trees, but. Uh, so this story is very it's very well known. It goes sometimes under the slogan of uh, Kerr CFT, but there's also a resurgence of this in the context of SYK. Uh, but once you rotate this nut charge, you will find that this temperature left that was anywhere vanishing uh, in the sort of Lorentzian case now actually can vanish. And it can vanish actually leading to what's called the, the self dual point. Right? So when M is equal to N, you reach this tip of the extremal solution. That is a subtle point that only happens when you are in this uh, sort of analytically continuous signature. In Lorentzian, you don't see this. And we know already that in the extreme, so in the subtle point, there is something uh, there is something very interesting, which is that this uh, way of removing any spin dependence of the metric. So this usually is called the Newman Janis shift. It's a Newman Janis boost. But if you have the care, this care tau not solution. At the self dual point, you can essentially gauge away the whole spin dependence. So what that tells you is that no matter what spin you have, uh, you will always have a rotational symmetry, right? Because you can remove the spin by 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 uh, uh, transformation, and that sort of restores this rotational symmetry. So this is how these two stories fit fit together. The sort of usual care story in the extremal case records this uh, neck geometry that has the rotation group. Uh, in the sort of uh, self dual story, as you go to a self dual point, you still recover an SO3 just because you can gauge away the spin. So you have these extended symmetries of the metric itself. Uh, then you can ask about what is the tree being analog of that statement. But there's also something happening for warp ADS3 black holes uh, that uh, I'd be happy to discuss. So, what is this self dual point? So, there's some symmetry emerging in the self dual point. Uh, in terms of amplitudes, you can also compute uh, some kind of curvature invariance of this of this solution, and you will find that there is sort of a Riemann subdual and Riemann anti-subdual components of the curvature. One of them obviously vanishes as you take m plus or minus m. 
So this is a statement that this actually comes from some three-point amplitudes. You can just compute them uh, using quantum theory. And, uh, essentially use some kind of funny Penrose transform, and eventually you find that one of these scalars correspond to plus, uh, plus helicity, and the other one corresponds to minus. So that's just the realization that by taking n plus or minus n, you're just killing one of the gravitons coupled to the to the uh, to the uh, to the black hole. So that's kind of the analog of the gravity gra to the electromagnetic dynamo. Right. So you, now you have this sort of magnetic and electric charges sort of cancel exactly so that you get one of the you, you lose one of the uh, helicities. Uh, nevertheless, the actual momentum of the black hole should still be thought as just m. The n is just an extra sort of rotation parameter. <laughs> so uh, in, in this talk, we will explore the fact that the self-dual, uh, I, I briefly mentioned that before, but the self-dual point is very closely connected to so twister space and the Penrose transform and all that. In fact, very recently, uh, this sort of Penrose transform idea of uh, you know, taking some twister functions have been very, have been used to compute the two-point function of Kerr-Tabner in the self-dual point. So uh, this computation is just essentially the same as uh, uh, as the four-point function of the uh, I, sh I should have drawn it here, but it's essentially just taking you know a black hole background given by a very massive particle and then computing this two-point this two-point correlation function. So uh, this has been done exactly is non perturbative in uh, in Newton. And there are a couple of things that you can immediately see uh, by, by, by looking at, at this amplitude. We said there's an a structure, there's an interior structure that's just there uh, sitting on your nose. So uh, the, first, the first sort of reflection of this is that if you take this factorial uh, uh, and you can until you continue to a, a gamma function, you will find that there is a spectrum uh, of resonances in this amplitude. And in fact, that spectrum happens uh, by the quantization of this of this sort of gamma function, only when two n omega is integer. So that's a, that's actually the spectrum of the of the of the self solution. It's quantized. The energy is quantized just because you have these extra symmetries. And and we will see that that resonates with you know it being exactly the like hydrogen atom. And the other thing you can see is that because this spectrum is quantized, uh, there's a stable photon ring. So there's no decay. There's no imaginary part of this of these frequencies that tell you there's some sort of decay wave. Uh, that means it's a stable photon ring, and uh, that that needs to be checked. I don't think people have really computed the, these geodesic equations, but it's strongly suggested just from the relation between this solution and the sort of a conal approximation that tells you what is going on with the geodesics. Uh, another cool uh, sort of uh, conjecture that comes from this amplitude is that there is an absence of the perihelion precession, essentially because from a very old story, we know that this perihelion precession uh, is not there in integral theories, as in the Kepler problem. Uh, in this case, uh, I, I didn't put the reference here, but it can be sort of traced back to the existence of this sort of plus plus, but not plus minus amplitudes. So, so the fact that there's no helicity flip, flip kind of resonates with uh, the expectation that there's no perihelion precession, which is again the existence of a Laplace Runge lens range. Okay, so how do we make all of these all these conjectures explicit? So what we do is we first need to sort of make the conformal structure explicit of this solution. So going back to this uh, sort of metric here, uh, it's written in some boyer Lindquist coordinates. It only has some uh, sort of asymmutal symmetry, but no rotation symmetry. Well, what happens if you introduce these sort of conformal coordinates? So you introduce these conformal coordinates. They are sort of motivated from some amplitude computation. And what happens is that you sort of reabsorb the whole spin dependence. So you end up with some metric uh, that's essentially a warp ADS3 metric. It has no spin parameter at all. It has been absorbed in the coordinates. And, and it has some warp factor, it's called F, that when F is one, is ADS3, so you know what symmetries you have. So you end up with this very simple looking metric. And you can see, of course, that it's independent of uh, spin A. So what you have done is you have absorbed this spin A uh, by a diffeomorphism, right? So that's essentially sort of newman yanis uh, boost uh, that is not really a diffeomorphism unless you are in the sub dual point. But it is very explicitly a diffeomorphism in this in this case. And also, as I said, the, the metric exhibits this warp ADS2 structure, 
which is very familiar uh, if you're familiar with the next story, uh, uh, in the near horizon limit of this care black hole. So as you very as you go close to this near horizon limits, uh, you find this warp ADS structure. Uh, but here we didn't do any of that. We didn't even define what horizon is. The, the metric was itself a, a, a warp ADS tree without any limit. So it's exactly uh, the sub two isometry that doesn't come from any approximation. So we can say in this lore, actually very precisely, we can say the self void point is its own near horizon. It's con it's it's its own near horizon uh, limit. So there's no sort of separations of the scales in the, in the sort of EFT sense. Uh, and here, uh, what, what I just wrote is the uh, isometries that you will find for an ADS3. So if you just take ADS3, isometric group is S of 2R plus S of 2R. Uh, in this case, because of this warp, warp factor, only one of these survives as an isometry. So just write in the sort of usual sort of form of the angular momentum in sort of spinner variables, you can essentially check that these are killing vectors of this thing. Uh, the other set of killing vectors you get by changing time and, and, and angle in this way. Uh, but you find that it's not an isometry. Nevertheless, you will see in a second, it's still a symmetry of the wave equation. So, so this warp ADS3 doesn't have the isometry of ADS3, but it still has the hidden symmetries of, of it. So how, how come how come all this all this all this just comes out of the software point? Well, <clears throat> the sort of underlying reason for it uh, is indeed uh, the fact that these sort of self plus solutions were uh, indeed uh, sort of recovered using these twister twister amplitudes. And uh, and indeed, uh, if you actually think of amplitudes, there is a very natural prescription of going uh, to twister space. So so what happens is that you you, you should think of this set coordinates as these lambda coordinates that we use in, in spinner variables. And the sort of natural twister variable for that coordinate is uh, is uh, is this sort of four component uh, four component vector. So if this really comes from twister space, uh, that what that means is that not only you have a four-component vector, you have a symmetry of four-component vectors. So that means that the symmetry group should be this uh, SU4 because this, these things are complex now. And you expect that set bar, the conjugate of that transforms sort of the, in, the, in the adjoint of, uh, sorry, not the adjoint, but the conjugate of this representation. Right? So if you write down the generators for this SU4, uh, this is the first, sort of first candidate that you would, you would write down if you expect this symmetry to be there. And let me just say that this symmetry is indeed not only SU4, but there's some, there's some very simple natural cover, uh, sorry, double cover, uh, that sort of maps it to SO4,2. So uh, going back to these coordinates, right? So we, we take these coordinates and we'll just write down in the twister. So we, we write down the twister generators, we sort of translate them to, to these coordinates, and we find this SO4,2 on here. So, uh, so there are a couple of things that you, can, that you can check, is that these linear generators, there's some sort of momentum generators, there's some differential operators, and there's some angular momentum. There is some particular form of position in the sense that it commutes, uh, it has canonical commutation relations with X. X and P have canonical commutation relations. And there is something that has two derivatives, which is usually in, in the SO4,2 in the twister languages, is special conformal transformation that we all know from amplitudes. And, uh, and, uh, and in this case, indeed, what you can map to, to is essentially the same killing tensor that I was uh, I was describing for care. So because it's quadratic in the in the in the uh, in the derivatives, you can actually covariantize this to look exactly like one of these killing tensor operators. And not only that, indeed you have three components. Uh, if you if you forget about k zero for a second, these three, three components transform under as a triplet under the action of this L just because of the SO4,2 value. So indeed, that tells you that these three components are a vector. And that vector is exactly the uh, sort of general relativity version of the laplace runge lens vector of classical mechanics. And indeed, you can even go and check further what's the relation between k and p and l. So because k has two derivatives, essentially given by p cross l, which is the laplace runge lens identity. Right, but the, the c there, that's harder. What was that c? So C is, yeah, uh, one of the C actually is the Carter constant, but this is a triplet of C's that happens in the sub point. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. So essentially in the care, in, as, as you go away from the sub point, only the C3 will survive and it will become the Carter constant. 
Uh, so, uh, so what happens with the wave, the wave equation in this space? Well, uh, indeed, you have to do some some uh, some funny rescaling. Uh, if you remember, this n omega combination happens to be uh, quantized, so you can actually just rescale very naturally. Uh, set goes to this quantity. You will find some extra factors of omega, and once you do this rescaling, you can essentially just write the wave equation in this in this space time as uh, as uh, simple as this. So take k zero, the first generator, and take l three just to quantize the uh, sort of uh, it's essentially just yes, conjugate to time. Uh, so this is essentially the energy, and then k zero is essentially the wave equation. So you just take your metric, compute all the Christoffel symbols, compute the uh, sort of Curvature and everything, and essentially you end up with this very very simple generator, which is K zero. And moreover, you know how K zero transforms under this algebra, and you know exactly why of these generators commutes with K zero. Indeed, you, should, you can check that L commutes with K zero, P doesn't commute with K zero, and and so on. So you know what are the hidden symmetries just from the SO four uh, But there is more. So indeed, if you just write K zero in this form. <clears throat> um, uh, you can immediately ask what's the near zone limit. So the near zone is, uh, again, it's just the, 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 the region where the, the wave is uh, small frequency. So you just sort of kill this sort of uh, potential term uh, of, of K0. And actually, I should say that this potential term makes this problem nothing but the four dimensional, uh, nothing but the four dimensional uh, uh, harmonic oscillator. This was very, very nicely explained in, in the paper by Eric Tucker. And the the uh, the sort of killing of this potential term immediately tell, tells you that the sort of near some limit of the of this black holes is 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 is, is just a simple sort of flat free uh, free Lagrangian or, or free wave equation, and indeed it, this looks seemingly simple uh, in the sense that going back to the very complicated Fourier Lindquist coordinates, you can sort of separate the system into these two equations: an Einmer equation and a real equation. Which are exactly the love symmetry uh, Casimir's. So the whole love symmetry story in this point just sort of resumes itself into the very simple flat, uh, flat uh, wave equation. So, going back to my first question, um, my confusion was this love symmetry is true in the near zone, but it's the consequences of the love number being zero is true for the whole act, for the whole world diameter. Right. That that's a little confusing. Why, why is that? I mean, like, how is how is a how is a loss of coefficient zero in a particular limit? Because there are symmetries there, but then the zero is true everywhere. Then is that? Oh yeah. So so it's it's it's, it's zero in the in the near zone, but it can be uh it can be used to compute uh, cross sections. Uh, uh, or is the statement that all it is is a near zone effect? Is it really nothing like? Well, it's, 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 it's an Yarson effect, but it can be matched, right? So, so through matching, so you want to match in the same in the same spirit of the usual cross section computation of the first cross section computation. You sort of want to match your near some wave equation with your far some wave equation, as long as there is some overlap. So, of course, the near symmetry, the, the love symmetry, lives here, uh, uh, but it tells you about what happens near the horizon. You know, if you think black holes are Shaped by their horizon, then that's what you would expect. But yeah, that's that's a that's a good point. So, um, how much time do I have? Is that a, a little more than twenty minutes. Twenty minutes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm going. Yeah, I'm probably going to need just ten minutes. So the uh, the wave operator actually becomes this sort of love symmetry Casimir's. Uh, uh, on the on the nose after you do this uh, this uh, change of coordinates, and uh, there is something interesting about this uh, love symmetry Casimir that I can just mention because I have enough time. Uh, if you look at the uh, the sort of uh, 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 spin dependence of this thing, right? This is a very complicated equation. It's, uh, it's again you know one of these kind of confluent confluent Hoyne equations. So you you will see that oh. Actually, I need to solve it numerically and perturbatively and expanding the small spin and all that. But I just told you that there is a different morphism that just removes the spin immediately. Uh, 
And in the case of the spin zero, this is the uh, usual spherical harmonics, right? So how, how come these two things are compatible? I mean, the, this wave equation actually is not the spherical harmonic equation, but after this sort of uh, 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 diffeomorphism, it becomes the spherical harmonic. So what happens is that uh, these two these two equations are not uh, are not uh, uh, invariant under this diffeomorphism. So they actually start rotating uh, after you after you apply the diffeomorphism. So this is the invariant equation, but this separation of variables actually depends on the spin parameter. So you can write this equation as a Casimir of two uh, SL2R algebras in many different ways. And in fact, it's a particular symmetric way of writing it at the spin zero. But as, after you turn on the spin, uh, uh, these two equations are actually not, uh, not, uh, not analytic. So that, that, that effect uh, uh, is actually independent of the uh, charge just because this sort of, this uh, uh, angular equation doesn't depend on the nut charge. So even if you're not in the sub point, point, uh, you expect something like this. Okay, I think I just repeated. Yeah, I just repeated that slide. Uh, so that story at the near sun is very, very nice. But uh, but here, indeed, not even uh, in the near sun, we still have a symmetry. So even when omega is not zero, you get you just get this harmonic oscillator. So it's not the flat space uh, wave operator. You just get just a quadratic term that's completely trivial to 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 analyze. So indeed, uh, even with this non uh, zero potential. Uh, you still have the symmetries I mentioned, the SL2 R process of torch symmetry. So the subplot point kind of makes it exact, exact uh, the fact that you have uh, two SL2 R uh, groups acting on the wave equation. So uh, that was some sort of approximate statement beyond the subplot point. Okay, so uh, so this all points out and it smells like hydrogen atoms. So we have this Laplace from lens vector. We have the uh, sort of extended symmetries. We have quantization of the spectrum. We can solve things exactly. So what does it mean? So indeed, this is nothing but the hydrogen atom in disguise. And we can, of course, expect that because the spectrum is quantized in a particular way. And it essentially corresponds to dion spectrum. It's also known that the dion uh, wave equation is essentially just the uh, hydrogen atom. So uh, this can be made, this can be made uh, uh, manifest in the following way. Uh, so this is a technical part, but essentially, yes, really define your uh, your solution of the wave equation with some scanning parameter. So you just uh, split your wave equation in some way. Uh, you find that the angular momentum Casimir uh, depends on this on this not charge. So it looks like this uh, Dion equation. Uh, the sort of regularity of this uh, sort of uh, spherical harmonics tells you that the sort of energy times the nut charge has to be quantized to be an integer. And indeed, that's what happens for monopoles, right? That's what happens for uh, for the Dirac monopole. And the solution that satisfies this is called the uh, uh, monopole harmonic. So that's just the sort of wave equation in this basis. And then for the regular equation, you have to sort of rescale some, some, some radial function. And after you sort of clear up the, the dust and the derivatives and all that, you will end up with something that's textbook, textbook, uh, uh, textbook hydrogen atom uh, equation. And essentially the, 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 the solution is again given by uh, Lager, Lager polynomials, um, exactly as the hydrogen atom. So it's something that you can just sit and write down uh, uh, exactly. It's a textbook uh, uh, elementary function. Okay, so, uh, so that's, that's about the subplot point. So what happens beyond the subplot point and how these symmetries uh, survive? So uh, to understand it, it's very, very convenient to uh, to perturb away from the subplot point using this linear form. So this is called the Kirchhoff uh, Kirchhoff metric. What it tells you is that in this particular choice of coordinates, you can just expand your metric uh, linearly around uh, the, the flat space, and it's exact. So indeed something that looks like linear in G and linear in mass and not charge, so linear in G, will eventually become uh, an exact deformation in these coordinates. Now, one way to look at it is you can perturb around flat space and get some exact solution. But those exact solutions are not very interesting because essentially these are in plane waves. But as we perturb around, around the self point, we already know that the spectrum is quantized in a, in a, in a particular way. 
So we expect that the spectrum will essentially be degenerate because there's too much symmetry. But as we go away from the subtle point, we expect that symmetry to be uh, lifted. So we take the sort of perturbation to be around this parameter point to zero, right? So now lambda is your sort of expect sort of fine structure parameter, and you just sort of reshuffle this equation into self plot plus this lambda correction. And indeed, uh, just as the um, as the as the metric, it happens also for the uh, for for its dual, right? So for the derivatives itself uh, being uh, essentially the um, the wave operator, the same the same state, statement holds. You just perturb your wave operator uh, away from the software point, and now you can interpret this deformation as just a potential, a potential of the of the wave equation. So um, this exercise sometimes becomes a little tedious. So let's just do it for no spin. So for no spin, uh, we want we want to keep some intuition of what the radial dependence is. So we will essentially use this adapt form of the Boyer and increase coordinates. We can, we can also use the sort of full-fledged Kirchhoff ansatz, but we want to sort of be able to understand what you know these coordinates mean. So, uh, so we just sort of reshuffle our uh, our wave equation in, in a particular form that essentially makes it explicit, ex explicit that you have only a linear and quadratic lambda correction. Now, if you're worried about this lambda square part that wasn't here, it's just because there is a particular uh, ambiguity in the spin square coefficient that actually uh, can be reabsorbed, uh, but this is still present in, in these coordinates. Uh, and so you, you essentially get your free Hamiltonian plus some uh, two term curvature. Okay, and then you can define your potentials and you use first order, you can use first order perturbation theory. Uh, so nothing out of, uh, out of the ordinary, but with a particular form of your potential. So what you find is that your usual uh, your usual spectrum so spectrum uh, relation was lifted from e essentially being proportional to n to uh, a particular degeneracy that now depends on the on the angular momentum. So that means that you know, now you have a more fine spectrum, and the computation can also be performed as I said in of this Kirchhoff range. Okay, uh, so let me ask, let me just wrap up uh, with uh, with a few points. Uh, so in the old days of, of twister theory, uh, th this Goggly approach uh, proposed by Penrose and, and his friends uh, was attempting to quantize gravity around the self plot vacuum. So because all these instantons can be computed analytically, and there are all these beautiful solutions, it was natural to think of the cell points of the parameter and understand quantum gravity around those cells. Uh, of course, that approach didn't, didn't really pan out. There are many sort of problems with twister space after you go beyond this subtle point. Uh, but even if that's out of reach, we can still talk, in, in this talk, we have taken some, some inspiration of that, and we have proposed a scheme, so sort of systematic scheme, that sort of solves this care dynamics sort of order by order, perturbatively, uh, perturbatively away from the subtle point. And we have taken advantage of a particular structure of the, of the wave equation. So, very recent progress uh, uh, indeed oh, suggests sorry, that. What, what's the perturbative parameter? Uh, I mean, it, it, you said order by order. It, M minus like, 10. This is a perturbative. Just that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in the, in the potential, it's just a linear potential, but of course, we can do order yes. by order perturbation okay. theory with a linear potential. Okay. But if I want to learn about an actual curve, that's not a small parameter, right? A curve is very far away from the self -due. It's far away, but this is linearly exact. So it's still, uh, right, depending on the mass of the black, black hole, it would be far. But at least in the potential sense, it's linear. It's linearly away. Um, OK, so we have proposed a systematic perturbation. But we also know, I mean, I hope I, I convinced you in some way that these symmetries indeed survive. In, in one way or another, say in the near zone or, uh, or asymmetries of, of the wave equation. Uh, so we know that the existence of a killing young tensor is, can actually trace back uh, to this construction. And, and in fact, we know that there's a very, very rich family of symmetries uh, indeed appearing from the subtle sector, just because you have uh, this um, sort of MHV splitting functions that is still present, present in these collinear similarities of the more general sector. And 
not last, last but but not, not least, and forgive me, didn't type a very large number of reference here. It's a very nice sort of connection to color kinematic algebra in the so-called point that sort of expects to survive away from it. So with that remark, thank you so much. Um, The last comments, but that was too fast. Can you say just a little more? Uh, yeah, yeah, good. So um, there is a particular subplot sector uh, that has uh, 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 this extended color kinematic algebra exactly. Um, you can start asking about uh, consequences of the symmetry algebra uh, in general. And, Every time that we can write something in twister space, we can realize this sort of self-dual algebra. Essentially, it's a symmetry of, it's a symplectomorphism of twister space. Uh, and using using this constraint, in fact, you can find, you can rediscover things like here, essentially acting with these generators on your Wilson coefficients, sort of nails it down to a minimal coupling in the sense of, uh, in the sense of uh, the triple amplitude. So there's a particular sort of constraints you can get from, from, from imposing the subtle algebras. But the question of whether these subtle algebras are there beyond the beyond the subtle sector is it's so clear. In the introduction you said you learned something about two bodies. So what did you about the Good, good. Uh, well, that was one of the questions. And here we can solve, okay, so we have solved the geodesic, we have essentially solved the geodesic equation, but we can nail it down. So for example, for Kerr, the Carter appears in the geodesic for Pro, but for example, does it persist beyond the, the geodesic limit? You mean the Carter constant? Uh, or I guess in your, in your right, right, right. So, so you can you can write down a, a test body uh, uh, spin, spinning uh, on around care, and you will find that it has uh, even if it has spin, it has all these conserved quantities, essentially because of the Carter constant. Uh, I guess what you're asking is, you know, as you go to self force expansion whether such a symmetry is still manifest. Uh, Which is also what I meant by uh, what you have about two bodies. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I think that's, that's, that's a very interesting direction. Uh, right now, I think the, the sort of hope is that this spectrum of the wave equation tells you something about the two-body problem in the sense that uh, the particular, well, not, not much more than the actual uh, one-body sort of extreme mass ratio can tell you. But the sort of a spectrum uh, of the of the wave equation uh, is still more information than just a single geodesic, right? So you have this two-point function uh, of care uh, uh, in the sort of point that's exact. And uh, you can essentially use it to, you know, do these force computations, but you can also uh, use it to compute quasi normal modes and resonances. Uh, so all this information, even if Maybe it's not all, all the information that you need, but it still has much more information than just uh, the carrier, let's see. More questions, Robert? I should say there's a particular diagrammatic expansion uh, for, for these four-point functions. But we, yeah, currently we don't know exactly how how uh, how comprehensive that is. But maybe it's still just part of the self sector. But we can still think about perturbing uh, the wave equation with negative helicity gravitons. Try to see if that uh, makes sense of any order. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, let's thank Alfredo again.